One of the things that was funny to me about that is we, we would be working on some car when I was working at the dealership over and we'd be one we beating beating us up. You know, we had to try to figure out what's wrong with it. And we'd be working and working and working on it. And then uh, we finally get it where it, it seemed like it was fixed, you know. And it left, you know, and they were seemed happy with it. And two or three weeks went by and I told the shop owner one day, I said, Well, I guess we got that such and such a car fixed because I hadn't seen he shut your mouth. It'll be in the red, it'll be in right up here this afternoon if you mention it. Just don't talk about it, you know. So that's what I'm saying. If you say I ain't got a traffic ticket in a while, you gonna get one this afternoon on the way home. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Do sir, because you'll get one too. I ain't laughing. Nobody got a traffic ticket. All right. Now then, let's look at this. This is a what do you know test. We're gonna find out what you know uh, when you're looking at the valves in a cylinder head. What's one easy way to identify the intake valves? And how are you going to know you're looking at intake valves? How can you tell? Like I'm looking at a cylinder head laying on a bench back there. You know. Huh? Well, no, it's just a head that's laying on a bench. It ain't, there's no camshaft moving no valves or anything. Because this is like the, that, that, it's like that 350 Chevrolet cylinder head. I'm going to look at that thing. How can I tell? Just looking at that cylinder head, how can you tell which one's the intake valve? The intake valve is bigger. Usually, I mean, the intake valve will be bigger than the other. Furthermore, you got to look at which valves lined up with which runner. You know, the intake uh, valve is going to be lined up with the intake runner, isn't it? So if you've got the, the the valves, the runner going to that particular valve, if it's coming from the intake, it's going to be an intake valve. If it's coming from the exhaust, it's going to be an exhaust valve. Because you can look at the head and tell, you know, which is the intake, which is the exhaust. Ain't that right? You knew that one, the big one was the intake valve, didn't you? Huh? Yeah, you, you were just talking so soft-spoken and everything. All right, so uh, it's on the intake side of the head. All right, the crankshaft completes how many degrees of rotation in order for every cylinder to complete all four strokes, intake, compression, power, and exhaust? 720, 720 degrees. It's two full turns. Like I said before, like on that three-liter engine there, if I could catch all the air and turn it full, two full turns, it would move a bag. If you got a bag of air, there'd be three liters of air in that bag. You know, if it has perfect volumetric efficiency. In 10 words or less, explain what the camshaft does. Opens, opens, opens and closes the valve. That is not complicated at all. What, what is another job the camshaft has on some engines? Matter of fact, on quite a few engines. Good answer. What else does it drive? Pistons. Right. Which one is it that the pistons ride over? What about the oil pump? It drives oil pump on a lot of not on every engine because some of them are driven by other things. Some of them are driven by, by believe it or not, that Toyota Camry engine on stand out. Toyota is driven by the, uh, I mean, the oil pump is driven by the timing belt. It's got a little pulley on it, a little sprocketed pulley, and it's driven by the timing belt. And on some of them, it's on the nose of the crankshaft. Got me? So, like on that Crown Vicky engine over there, it's on the nose of the crank. That's all Yeah. All right. The uh, let me see in tent. Uh, let's see. Excuse me. What is the best coolant water mix for most vehicles? You know, some of them at 70-30, but 50-50 is what it is on most of them. Um, on an engine with a timing belt, how would you determine whether or not the crank, uh, camshaft and the crankshaft are mechanically out of time? Yeah, and what I'm going to do in that situation is I'm going to turn, I'm going to find out where the camshaft marks are, and I'm going to turn the crankshaft. Well, if you turn the crankshaft, let's say you've got access to the camshaft. Got me? Maybe there's a little plug on the cover or there's a top of the cover you take off so you can see the camshaft marks. I'm going to turn the engine. If I turn the engine and the camshaft doesn't move right away, I know the timer belt jumped on. Yep. Got that? Okay, the second thing, uh, I'm going to turn it, and I'm going to turn it around until those camshaft marks are lined up. I'm not even going to pay no attention to the crankshaft for a mark until I turn it, camshaft marks are both lined up, and when the camshaft marks are lined up, every time the camshaft marks are lined up on just about every engine, and I say just about because there are rare, rare exceptions to this, the crank mark will be lined up. Now, some of them, they've actually got the gears out here turning some gears inside, and you don't get, it's not perfect every time, you know? Uh, and like if you got a balance shaft or something like that, uh, the balance shafts on some engines that I've seen, has to, you got to turn it like 48 turns before it lines up again. But typically, if you line up the camshaft mark, the crankshaft mark will be lined up. Now, what's wrong with using the crankshaft mark to do this? You got any idea? It's okay. I mean, if you put the, if you line up the crankshaft mark, the camshaft marks are only going to line up every other time. 
So you know how Murphy's Law works. Let's say you've lined up the crankshaft marks. You make your, your camshaft marks maybe 180 out, and you have to turn it another round. So I just turn it until I see camshaft mark lined up, and then I'm done. If these are lined up and that one's not, then you categorically know that the engine's out of time, and you've got to do something about it. I have seen time and belts just strip a couple of three teeth and get slightly out of time and make them lose power and surge and cut up like that. See, So when the time and belt jumps, it doesn't always jump and cause the car to die. Sometimes it just jumps a little bit. Okay. Uh, does the crankshaft turn faster than the camshaft? It turns twice as fast as the camshaft. The crankshaft. The crankshaft turns twice as fast as the camshaft. You know, if the engine is, uh, if the crankshaft is turning a thousand RPM, the camshaft is turning half that fast. It's turning 500. Like that. All right. Which shaft drives the oil pump on an engine? Sometimes it's driven by the camshaft, sometimes it's driven by the crankshaft, sometimes it's not driven by either shaft. Well, technically it is on that Toyota I was talking about, the crankshaft is what provides the power to turn it, but it's not attached directly to the crank. It's a belt driven thing. Okay. Uh, if the cylinder diameter, which is the bore, is greater than the stroke, which is the travel of the piston, that is referred to as what? Over square or under square? Is that one of the things that's hard to remember if you ain't got a memory bug? Well, well you know, when a, you got a, if the bore and the stroke, if a bore and the stroke on an engine are exactly the same, like if it's got a four inch stroke, in other words, the piston moves up and down four inches, and the bore is four inches, that's a square engine, right? If the bore is bigger than the stroke, in other words, if it's got a four and a half inch bore and a three inch stroke, it's over square. It's over square. If it's got a three inch bore, and a four inch stroke, it's under square. Got that? Now that kind of stuff will get you mixed up if you don't come up with some kind of memory bug to figure mm -hmm. it out, right? How is piston ring end gap different from piston ring side gap? Is that tricky or what? <coughs> How is it? Got any idea? All right, everybody listen to this because it's pretty important. End gap is measured between the ends of the piston ring with the piston ring put in the cylinder. You, put the, you take the piston ring off the piston, you put it in the cylinder, you push a piston down there to make sure that it's nice and level. Then you're going to get your feeler gauge and those rings, uh, the tips of those rings, you don't know how far apart they are. Now why is that important to do that? The ring, the ring gap. You know, the ring end gap is what I'm talking about. The gap, gap in between the ends of the piston ring when it's in the cylinder and you've actually took a piston with no rings on it and just, you know, you don't want it in there crooked. And so if you slide the piston down and push it about, you know, an inch down in the cylinder, it's going to be nice and level and you're going to be able to get your feeler gauge and measure. And you ought to see, you know, a thousandth of an inch or one and a half thousandths or something like that. If there's not enough ring gap, then what will happen is you may get it put together and you may get the pistons put in, but when you crank it up, the darn thing will run and it'll get hot and it'll quit running. And until it cools off again, it'll crank up and it'll run about 10 minutes and it'll quit running because the rings will swell up and they won't be no, you know, get too tight. And I've known of that kind of thing happen before. Because for years and years and years, you know, whenever I first started out, we would put rings and bearings in one and just throw them in their own face without measuring a dead gum thing. It's really surprising how often you can get away with that. But it depends on how much is at stake. You know, if you're trying to do some work on somebody's vehicle and you're fixing it, you don't want it having trouble because you didn't do something because they're going to come back and want you to fix it and they're not going to pay you a second time. So you better do it right the first time. You know what I'm saying? All right, so the long and the short of it is, we had one here that we were rebuilding that belonged to this young boy. I was a little 2.8 in a Camaro, and he wanted to rebuild it. And if somebody wants to rebuild, we don't typically rebuild engines in here because if you rebuild an engine in, in, at the venue that we're in, there's no guarantee of anything here in the school. So what happens there is if uh, if somebody, some yo-yo is, is, you know, if you get, especially got a couple of guys working on it, it's this, you know, he said, he said kind of thing, and then somebody leaves something loose and it comes apart, you know, a couple of, you know, weeks later, you got a $2,000 catastrophic failure that a school does not have anything in place to pay for that. See what I'm saying? They were trying to pay for anyway. That says we're, you know, whatever. So that's usually when we'll get an engine from a salvage yard and pop it in there. If that one goes south, then we just get another one from the salvage yard and put another motor in it. You know, we've had to do that before. We've had them, you know, put an engine in there and it lasts a little while and come apart and call the salvage yard up, you know, six weeks later and say, hey, this engine went bad, you sold it, so they bring us another one, we pop it in there. You know, because we don't charge any labor anyway. Well, the long and short of it is, this kid was building his engine. And, uh, and he, I said, we need to check your piston ring end gap before we put it in there. And he was sort of confused. He wanted to get on with the job. I said, let's check the ring end gap. 
We checked the end gap and the new rings that he got. He didn't have no ring gap. I mean, them, the ends of those piston rings were just crammed up against one another. So what you do then is you take them out and you file them a little bit with a file. And then you put them back in there and you measure it and you make you some ring gap. Doesn't hurt a doggone thing. You actually, but see, a lot of people don't even think about measuring ring gap. They just throw a set of rings on there, pop it in there, and that will cause you sometimes to tear one back down. So you don't want to go there. You know, make sure you measure. You know, when you're doing carpenter work, you measure twice and cut once. You know what I'm talking about? You don't want to, you're going to do the job one time. It's better to measure it two or three times to make sure than it is to just say, well, I'll, this will be eight, you know. That's all you're going to plastic gauge your bearings for the same reason. Okay, what's side gap now? Ring well, side gap. Is a, so a piston ring end gap is measured with the Feeler gauge piston. with the ring in the cylinder. Now, uh, Brown, grab me a piston out of that. I need a piston with some rings on it out of that box over there. Make sure it's a piston that's got rings on it. What's the measurement supposed to be? About a thousandth of an inch or something like that. It'll be. They actually have got some specs sometimes published. So the side gap is basically you're going to put your feeler gauge. See this ring land? You're going to put your feeler gauge between the ring and the land on the piston. That's side gap. That's how much can the ring go up and down in that land. If the pistons are worn out, they'll be able to move. This is pistons are brand new, so you don't measure it in there. You stick your feeler gauge in there, you know. But I'm going to tell you there's a lot of people that don't measure those. Something else you can do with a piston, too, to see if it's cracked. And this is not even on our chest, but you you can tap it like that with something like your pocket knife or something. And if you got, you might not even see a crack, but if it's cracked, it won't go tink tink tink. It'll go boop 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 boop. It'll have a different sound to it. If you tap it around, just tap around them. You'll find a cracked piston like that when you won't see it with your naked eye. And uh, a cracked piston can ruin your whole day after you put it back together and everything. You know what I'm saying? All right, put that right up there. All right, now then, so. Um, Side gap. Yeah, side gap is measured between the, the land on the piston and the ring that's in that land. What is a torque to yield bolt? Torque to yield. What is a torque to yield bolt? You guys have done it before. A torque to yield bolt is a bolt that you tighten to a certain torque and then you go another 90 degrees and you go another 90 degrees. Sometimes it'll go 72 degrees or something stupid like that. Well, uh, I was over there with uh, where Matt uh, Winters is working now, and uh, they were putting uh, this Explorer engine back together. They had to put new timing chains on everything. And the uh, the bolt in the back, and that gear in the back of the camshaft, or the jack shaft, which is runs where the camshaft used to run, they had to torque both of those to a certain torque and then go another 90 degrees. Well, he's got a, a real expensive snap-on torque wrench like I had never seen before. And somebody, a lot of, you know, some other body may have seen one, but you, it's digital, kind of like the ones we got. And you set it on 90 degrees, and then you lay it down, and you leave it alone for just a second. And then when it beeps, you pick it up, and you, you've turned that thing 90 degrees. It's giving you degree numbers as you're going, and when it gets 90 degrees, it goes beep, beep. <laughs> I mean, that's a real, but it's a torque angle gauge. Like you got, it's got 72 degrees or something like that. You got to actually have something to measure. 90 degrees, you can figure out. 72 degrees is tricky, right? Uh, so that's something. That's torque to yield means you're stretching the bolt. Now, why do you have a torque to yield bolt usually? Well, where's the most common place you're going to find it? Aluminum cylinder heads. Aluminum cylinder heads will typically have torque to yield bolts on them. Cast iron cylinder heads typically won't. Now, why would an aluminum cylinder head have a torque to yield bolt when a cast iron one wouldn't? Good, good answer. Aluminum expands and contracts. You're usually going to have some gaskets that's got some slippery stuff on them too for aluminum heads. Got me? I get graphite or something like that. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, what's the difference between CF classification motor oil and SF classification? Compression fired spark One of them for diesel. Compression fired for diesel. SF's for spark fired engines. Okay, that's the question number 11. You're checking a vehicle with an oil pressure gauge that reads zero all the time. What do you do first? What's the next thing you're going to do? Like they come in, the car comes in, you draw the ticket, oil pressure gauge is inoperative. What are you going to do? That's a good start. That's a good start. That's a real good start. What's the second thing you do? That's well, you want to do easy first. That's not easy. Checking oil pressure. It means you're going to, what he was talking about is you screw the oil pressure sending unit out, you screw a gauge in there, you crank it up, and you see what your mechanical gauge is reading. I'm not going to do that until 
I have taken the wire that plugs to the oil pressure sending unit and grounded it, and I don't see where that gauge goes. If I ground it and that gauge goes, dong, I'll know that we got good wire all the way up. What if I ground it and the gauge still don't move? I need to find out it's electrical or gauge problem, right? Uh, on some of the Chevrolet trucks, uh, that they've got a uh, this guy that I had put over there at the uh, Chevrolet place in Andalusia back years ago. Um, I had always taught these guys, always check technical service bulletins. You know, if you get a problem, the first thing you need to do, that's why we spend so much time going to Identifix or looking for TSBs and all this kind of thing, which Identifix has TSBs and all that. It's a great resource. Okay, so he says, they said, none of the gauges on this cluster are working. And so he checked the fuses initially, which is quick and easy. He didn't see any fuses wrong. He would look at TSB, and it says that a reflash might be required to bring the cluster back online. <laughs> well, I'll do that. So he plugged in the Tech 2, did a reflash, brought and woke the cluster up. Huh. And the people that, uh, and the, the, the service manager says, I am so glad you did that. And he said, why? He said, there's seven other guys in here that have put, uh, gate, I mean, instrument clusters on there and still didn't fix them. <laughs> <laughs> they never looked at the TSB. You see what I'm saying? Everybody wants to throw a part at it. But if you think, if you're a thinker, you won't be, you know, throwing a part at it every time you turn around. Okay, so all right, that's going to be the. Uh, let's jump into this other test right here, right quick. We've only got 50 questions on this other test. It shouldn't take us too long. Right? 50. All right, so all right. That's the what do you know test. We're going to meld that together with the engine repair to test one. We're going to try to go through this quick enough where we won't be in here any longer than about at least two or three or four hours. No, we're going to be through for, for that. What do you call a service technician's protective head cover? Bump cap. Yeah, it's a bump cap. Anybody here ever wore a bump cap? When, when did you wear a bump cap? When I worked at Smart. Yeah, you were pretty smart. Okay. All safety glasses should meet standards by... And and see, this is a, this, some of these questions are the same ones that are on the uh, safety test I gave the uh, fundamentals guy the other day, but we get out of these pretty quick. What temperature should water be at when you wash your hands? Uh, Incidentally, what does ANSI stand for? American National Safety Standards. Standards, in the, yeah, Institute, that's, what, that's good. Uh, these jacks are, are, very, are, are uh, you know, floor jacks. They're actually reach those, meet, tested by those standards, too. If you're going to wash your hands, it ought to be 110 degrees. How hot are your hands? 98. 98. You want, to, you want water to be a little bit warmer. You don't want to blister your hands up. Um, one time, uh, when I told, I was complaining the water wasn't hot enough in there, Stan went in there, he cranked that thing up, wet water to make coffee. He's coming out of the morning. <laughs> must have been 190 degrees or something. It'll be all over, see? All right, so, uh, but anyway, that's been fixed now, so it ain't that hot. Uh, hearing protection should be worn anytime noise levels exceed what? 60. 90 decibels, actually, 90 decibels, and we've got them things you stick in your ears out there. Um, who has been driven completely wacky by somebody using an air hammer on the other side of the shop? Ah, it just drives you crazy. The guy that's doing it, it ain't that loud for the guy that's doing it, but it seems like it gets bigger and bigger to the you know the farther out you go, and you know hearing protection is important when you're doing that kind of thing. Um, Two technicians are discussing the safe use of a wrench. Technician A says you ought to pull it. Technician B says you ought to be pushing it. You're basically going to pull it, but that doesn't really sound. I actually heard a snap on guy say, "Well, you don't ever push your wrench; you always pull it." And then I say, "You ain't ever worked on a car, have you?" <laughs> like sometimes you just can't pull it. You know, you can't get somewhere. Like if it has to go the other way and you can't get above it, you're going to have to push it. And that's all there's to it. The downside about pushing it is, if it comes loose all of a sudden, you're going to bark your knuckles against something. You don't push. You get. Yeah. Well, yeah, you that's can if you, if you can get a good hit on it. You know, that works too, you know. Yeah, you're supposed to pull it if you can. Here's something else. Don't ever use a open end when you can get a box in on it. You know, and if you put a box in or a socket on it, make darn sure it's on there all the way. If you put it on there sort of halfway on there so it rolls off and then all of a sudden it's rounded off, then somebody else put a power tool on it and make it completely round and then they want moi to come work a miracle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's how things happen like sometimes. So don't go there. Uh, Okay, what are you? Why are we using uh, exhaust hoses? What gas is the problem? Hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide. What? Deadly in high concentrations is uh, number six. That's basically going to be a, a carbon monoxide. And the process of combustion occurring with a, without an open flame is spontaneous combustion. These are quick questions because they're uh, when using a fire extinguisher. What word can be uh, used to remember what to do? Is basically a little memory. Pass. Yeah, there's a guy that's been had some training. Yeah, pass. 
Okay, what type of fire extinguisher is usable for most types of fires? Uh, well, actually the dry chemical. Yeah, and uh, it has an acrid smoke. We actually set a Lincoln on fire over here a couple of semesters ago and we had to put it out with a fire extinguisher. Oh, was that yeah. when I was here? I think so. Spring? Yeah, you guys were working on what, the airbags in the back or something like yeah, that? Yeah, we were replacing the airbags and the shock. We were replacing the airbags and the shocks and the shock Whoosh. was... Uh, we actually, I said, well, I'll just, uh, you know, burn this nut off of there. So, phew, and the flame went off of there, and it went through the little thin metal behind the seat, and it set the foam on fire on the oh seat, <laughs> <laughs> which was bad news. So we shot it with a fire. We put it out, you know, wasn't a big deal. It didn't set, it would have burnt the car all the way down if we had to put it out, you know. Occasionally, you'll, you know, set fire to one, and it's not a good idea. And that was, we did the shock on the other side using a different method. But anyway, um, sometimes point A to point B will get you in trouble when you ought to think about a, a different, you know, route. That's what we should have done that time. Technician A says shoes with comfortable insoles are more comfortable when standing for long periods of time. Yes. And steel-toed boots, well, are essential for protecting your feet from injury, but we're not really required to wear those in here. I have worked jobs where you were required to wear them, and I have had steel-toed boots save my feet. Uh, uh, that's pretty pretty important to remember that. I took a... a my, my my boss man, uh, when I was working at, for a little while, I worked for about three weeks in that forklift plant in Elba, and he says, take this uh, impact wrench and take this frame loose from this forklift. It was a forklift we were building, and the frame was like solid steel. It was like three inches thick, and it was just a heavy, heavy thing. And somehow or another, you know, I just stepped up there to take that thing loose. I mean, it didn't occur to me that when I took it loose, that frame was going to hit the ground, you know, and my boot was under it. You know, and it landed on that steel toe. It didn't fall very far, and the steel toe hip protected my foot. But I felt that I couldn't move. I was trying to move. My old foot was just trapped, you know. And so my lead man came walking by, and I said, Cowboy, come over here. I said, I got my... He said, what's, what's the matter with you, you know? He, he was always chewing gum, right? and a fast-talking guy. And I said, uh, I got my foot under this frame on his forklift. Oh, boys, oh, help, help, get him off here. So he called everybody, he got a big color blue. Everybody got off my foot. And he goes, all right, can you walk? You need to go to the hospital? I said, no, I got a steel toe boot. My foot's fine. I just couldn't move. And he goes, well, if I didn't know that's all that was wrong, I'd have just jap slapped you a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. But uh, but steel toe boots are a good thing to wear. I'm not I'm not going to talk against them at all. One of my guys that's in here in the morning is a young DE guy. Going wrong, my guy. He wears uh, mechanics coveralls and protective toe boots. But now his boots have got hard plastic toes in them, you know, instead of steel. I mean, they're made for, they're not steel toe, but they're halfway to steel toe. You see what I'm saying? Right. You can drop something on your foot and it won't, you know, cr crush your foot. But, you know, it wouldn't work if you got run over by Bradley or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so, wow. All right, so, but anyway, um, you're going down here. Uh, what type of glove is damaged by contact with petroleum products or solvents? Latex. You know what latex does on that? And then uh, mechanics gloves provide thermal protection. Okay. Page two. Uh, number 13, hazardous materials include all of the following except water, obviously. Asbestos, engine oil is technically hazardous. Brake cleaner is technically hazardous. Some brake cleaner, listen to this guys, this is important. Some brake cleaner is flammable and some brake cleaner is not. Don't assume just because you've used, a, like if you use a CRC, you know, the red and white can, it's not flammable. You know, you can actually spray it on the flame and it'll put it out. Most of the rest of this brake cleaner though is like a, you know, the human torch, man. It'll light you up. So uh, they ought to be some sort of standard for that. You know, but if, if you assume that this brake cleaner is not flammable because that one wasn't flammable, you may get in trouble. So be careful mm -hmm. about that. Uh, to determine if a product or substance being used is hazardous, consult MSDS. Yeah, material safety data sheet data sheets there. Fifteen, exposure to asbestos can cause what problem? Mesothelioma. Mesothelioma. We see commercials on TV all the time about that, right there. Okay. Wet asbestos is considered to be what? Solid waste. Just solid waste, that's all it is. Uh, anytime you're getting the, the, the dust off the brake shoes, like if you have to be doing a brake job, always do it with something wet. Just spray it with water, 409, whatever, to make sure you wet it so it don't so it don't fly. And um, all right, number 17, an oil filter should be hot drained for how long before you dispose of it? I say 12 hours. The the guy that came here with the with the hard hat and the clipboard that was fussing that time because we weren't puncturing our oil filters before we threw them in the trash. He said 24 hours, but you know 12 is what the uh, right answer is in this test right here. A used engine oil should be disposed of by everything except 
Hey, you don't so you don't dispose of used engine oil in the regular trash. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Huh? Got me. All right. All right. Nineteen. All of the following are proper ways to dispose of drained oil filter, except considered to be a hazardous waste and dispose of accordingly. What? That seems like a, a badly a badly written question. I hate this. This is. Hey. Hey, Jim. What's going on? Just about any time, you know, like uh, about right after lunch one day would be good. Not all that bunch to it, no. it would be okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, Jim, no problem. Okay, um, here we go. Now let's read that question again. I'm confused by 19. All of the following are the proper ways to dispose of a drained oil filter except A, semper recycling. Oh, dispose of in regular trash. That should be B. That, that answer key is wrong there. Huh. You're not supposed to just throw an oil filter in the trash. We've got them. We put them in a barrel back here, and Safety Clean comes and picks up the barrel and brings us a new barrel. And of course, they charge us for that, but, you know, one way or another, you're actually carting the old oil filter. We got about two-thirds of, of a barrel full of oil filter to wear right now because we do usually do quite a few oil paint changes in here. Uh, which act or organization relates, regulates air conditioning refrigerant? Clean Air Act. Mm, yes, sir. Clean Air Act. Uh, gasoline should be stored in approved containers to inc include what color? Red. A red container with yellow lettering. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, what they're saying is just a red container, but I will tell you that whenever the NATAF people came, uh, he made me put a sign on mine, because you know the yellow signs I put on the side of the gasoline tanker. Like I said, well, they're supposed to be on there. It says flammable liquid. Well, it said it on the top, but that if you just you had to look at it and you know almost shine a light across the suit, I put them big yellow signs on the side of it. So C is the right answer to that one. What automotive devices may contain mercury? Rear seat video displays. What's what's hid headlights? Is that them headlights that go? Oh, what what's hid though? What's that stand for? Very good. That's a, like basically lightning that's making that thing in there, and it's got gas in there, and all of the above. So 23. Which of the items is, is not to be considered personal protective equipment? Safety socks. <laughs> I got my safety. Safety socks. Safety socks. On. Oh, that's like night vision contact lenses. Huh? Okay. Yeah, those all are of very these. Useful. Yeah. All of these statements are correct except a. Pure water has a pH of seven, meaning it is neutral. B, the Environmental Protection Agency does not include corrosive materials in its hazardous waste list as published in the Code of Federal Regulations. C, respirators must be worn when working with some hazardous waste products. Or D, lower pH numbers indicate a substance that is more acidic. B is actually it. You know, when you go down from 7 on that scale, you're actually going more acid. Uh, like, for instance, Coca-Cola has got a uh, pH of 2. Yeah. And a battery acid is like one and a half, you know, so you can put a T-bone steak and a bowl of Coca-Cola will be gone in two days. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Coca-Cola is the best. It yeah. is. Kool -Aid. Yeah. They actually, they actually carry it on like, you know, you know, the wreck trucks, like for the interstate and stuff, they carry Coke with the clean up the mess. Yeah. It works too. All right. Number 25. I was, I was working on this car one time out there that I was thinking about getting for Matt over in Savannah. And this, uh, this this girl, we, we met her over there because we was looking at this car lot with this hoopla thing where they go say, somebody's going to buy a car for $50 and all that. Well, let's go over and just, you know, have nothing else to do. Well, she said, well, I got a car I need to get rid of, you know, that I'm not driving anymore because it doesn't run. So we went over there and she had dirty battery terminals and all. I said, well, let's just start out by cleaning your battery terminals because I go see about buying that car from her from that. And so I says, uh, I was looking at this acid all over battery terminals. I says, do you got any Coke? She said, oh, you mean soda pop? What else would I have meant? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, yes, soda pop. I don't want any cocaine, okay? And you're going to clean battery terminals with that anyway. You know, all right, number 26. Technician A says the diameter of a bolt is the same as the wrench size used to remove or install the fastener. Is that right? No. Did I skip 25? The thread pitch of a bolt is measured how? 25. That's actually both A and B. It can be threads per inch on standard bolts, and it's, it's, it's uh, 
millimeters, in other words, how many millimeters it is from one thread to the next on the uh, on a metric bolt, threads per inch on a standard bolt. All right. If I was working, these factory bolts are basically going to be uh, 17s. I mean, excuse me, it'll be a 15 usually, or a 14. Well, this will be 10. Now your uh, your Japanese cars will usually have a, a finer. This is a one and a half thread pitch, which is what we like on American cars. But on your uh, and it, it's metric. But on your Japanese cars, you're typically going to have a finer thread pitch, like a 1.0 or something like that, or maybe a one and a quarter. So the thread pitch is really important. If you just order a 10 millimeter bolt that long, you're probably going to wind up with the wrong thing. But you cannot specify the head size. On a 10 millimeter bolt, the, the head size is going to be a 17, which is close to an 11 16, but not exactly close enough to it. Okay, um, now then, let's see, I got way off uh, the reservation there. Where am I headed at? Well, a bolt that's threaded into a casting is often called a white. What you, what you got that? Uh, a threading in, that is a crazy question. Mm -hmm. A cap screw is what they're wanting for that answer. But you know, whatever. Um, a bolt is threaded into a casting. Now, a stud is a different thing. You know, the size of the marks on the head of a standard bolt indicate what? B and C. Yeah, you know, grade and uh, tensile strength. A bolt that requires a half inch wrench to rotate is usually what size when measured across the threads. What do you got? Hmm? Anybody know? Five sixteenths. It's going to be five sixteenths. Now that's typically, I mean, usually you're going to have one of those, you know, coming out of there. And that's pretty well standard. You're usually, if you've got a five sixteenths bolt, it's usually going to take a half inch wrench to turn it, even if it's a factory one. Have you ever noticed them funky bolts that's got a, like what they have on uh, cooling fans and radiator, I mean, and flywheels and stuff? The top of that bolt will kind of have a castellated look to it, but it never has a washer under it if it's made like that. I thought it was really interesting. I mean, like when they build them like that, if it's got a castellated looking head on it, it, it won't have a washer under it. And uh, I don't know exactly what the reason for that is, you know, but that's the way that I've always, ever, forever more since I've worked on cars, I've, the guy that worked, I worked with at Phyllis Station was the one that told me that, and I had noticed it since then. When somebody tells you something, you'll usually watch to see if what they said is true every time. You know what I'm saying? And so you're going to store that away. All right. 31. A bolt that required, no, excuse me, 32. A screw that can make its own threads uh, when it's installed is called a what? Self-tapping. Self-tapping. A lot of times you'll have these uh, self-tapping screws. Uh, they're really not all that great for most things, you know, I don't really like those that much, I don't have threads. All of the following are types of clips except what? Cotter. Cotter, as in welcome back, okay. What type of faster is most commonly used to retain interior door panels? Internal What about Christmas tree clips? You know those little things there that you just slide into that hole? That's what they are. Those those Ford Windstars had yellow Christmas tree clips on them that were so tough that you would bust the door panel trying to pull them out of that door every wow. single time. So what we had to do was we had to get a really thin, like a gasket scraper or something that's really thin and sharp, and cut those suckers. And I used to keep a big old box of them in my toolbox so that I could replace all of those darn things every time I pull the door panel off of a Windstar. Because, I mean, if you start trying to, you know, even use that fork tool to get them off, you're going to bust the door panel every single time. They were real tough. I don't know why they made them like that. But anyway, um, the number of threads per inch is referred to as what? Pitch. Thread pitch. Number 37. This stuff seems pretty well, uh, pretty basic, but uh, hang with me, okay? Uh, strength or classification of a bolt is known as the grade. Did I miss that? Metric thread pitch is what? Millimeters. And like in how many millimeters? Like 1.0, 1 1.1 1 1 and a quarter, 1, you know, one and a half, 1.75, 2, whatever. Um, now let me ask you this. Oh, pay attention to this. What if I've got a, uh, if I've got a, the higher the number on imperial thread, which would be their, our standard, our SAE stuff, the higher the number on that thread pitch, the finer the thread. Right? because it's more turns per inch, right? On metric, it goes the opposite direction. The higher the number, the coarser the thread. That's kind of like metric wire gauge. Metric wire gauge is basically the higher the number, the thicker the wire, because it's based on how many millimeters thick that wire is. You got me? Like if you've, but if, uh, 
as an E-wire gauge is. A 22 gauge wire is a really small wire and a 12 gauge wire is a big thick wire. Mm -hmm. The lower you go with your numbers, the bigger the wire gets. On metric, it goes the other way. The lower you go with the number, the smaller the wire gets. See, Bob? So just, you know, if you can get your head wrapped around that, you'll be a, a bump ahead right there. Um, let's see. Uh, hardware store non-graded bolts are suitable for use on suspension components. <laughs> of course not. Uh, metric bolt grade is indicated by... Yeah, exactly. Let me ask you this. Um, sometimes you got to be aware of this too. Um, the if you're doing something really, really important, that's where I'm talking about is life or death, and everything's got to be really strong and really hard. Uh, you either have to, you need to get either get the, the bolt that was manufacturer designated for that particular job, or you need to get one. Make sure that you're using some kind of American-made bolt. Or a bolt with a name on it. Like if you've got a bolt that you pull out of the bolt bin and it's got something like a triangle on it or something so you can't identify who made the bolt, the grade, the grading may not be accurate on those. And I've actually seen those. One time I was in a position, I got sent out there to the airport to fix a truck in the, you know, blowing misty rain out there when it was 30 degrees. And this big old truck that we had, the, had, uh, the outside wheel bearing had, come apart and twisted the end off. I had to take the king, king pin out and put a new spindle on that thing and all that stuff. And I was out there by myself, you know, with nobody to help me. I didn't have nobody I could go to and say, I can't, I can't, I can't, which is what I hear a lot around here. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't. Does anybody in here know that I can't doesn't belong in our vocabulary mm -hmm. in the shop? You don't say I can't, do you? I can't. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't. Yeah. Anyway, the long and short of it was I got a puller. And I got two quarter inch bolts because there's a little cap that went on the top of that kingpin was there. And I got a bolt that had a little triangle on it. It was growth grade five bolts. One of them was a Lake Erie bolt that had LE on the top of it, which is an American made bolt made by a company you could track. The other one just had a funky little triangle on it. It was made, made in Taiwan or somewhere. All right, so I started applying pressure with that puller. And that uh, Oriental made bolt started to stretch. And the other one didn't, but they were both the same grade. That was a side-by-side -side comparison of those two bolts. I didn't mean to do that, but it irritated the crud out of me because I had to dig in my toolbox and find another one that was a Lake Erie. First, I just got two of them, two quarter-inch bolts that would work, you know. And I had to go to the hangar where they were working on helicopters and borrow a torch and get out there, you know. I didn't think they'd have a torch in a helicopter hangar, but they did, you know. Anyway, long and short of it was, I got that thing out of there, but it, it took two American-made bolts to do it in a puller. All right, so uh, let's see. Um, incidentally, let me say this, too, while I'm talking. Let me qualify this. Um, and I've, I've said this in so many ways, other ways before, but whenever your uh, supervisor or your boss or something sends you to do something, they want to be able to just tell you to do it and not worry about whether it will be done or not, right? They don't want to tell you to do something, and then you have to come back seven or eight times and say, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know. <laughs> they want you to handle the problem, you know, you know, you go at it a different way, you know, and that's what the deal is. All right, let me see here. Uh, Metric bolt grade is indicated by numbers on the head. Now let's go to our next page. I know everybody else has already turned. I'm running behind. This is terrible. We'll get it in a minute, though. Metric nut strength is indicated by what? You like that? What about dimples? See the little dimples on the nut face? Uh, which, is, which of these is not a type of lock nut? Nylon ring, distorted, castle, and cotter pin? All these are locking nuts. That's 41. Um, which of these is used to cut threads in a drill hole? Die, tap, A and B, or neither or B. The tap cuts the threads in the hole, right? The dies cut threads on the outside. Okay, uh, which may be used to restore damaged threads? A die or a tap. They've also got things that aren't strong enough to cut the threads the first time, but they're strong enough to clean them out, and they call those thread chasers. You can get a set of those things that are just made for nothing except to chase thread. You got to make sure you're using the right size, though. Got me? We were chasing threads on that cylinder head with that tap. That was weird. I don't know if you ever heard us talking about that. But we could run that tap down in there smooth as silk. When we would start a spark plug, it'd go two turns and stop for a turn and a half. Well, I mean, it was trying to follow the thread somebody had messed up. Yeah, don't throw the spark plug down in the hole and hope it's okay because it's going to ding that first thread sometimes and you're going to make a mess. All right, number 42, 
Which of these is used to cut threads and drill holes? A tap. Which may be used to restore damaged threads? A tap. The most commonly used tap is what? Taper. That's going to be a taper tap. A bottom tap doesn't have a taper on it, but it'll cut threads all the way to the bottom of the hole. That's what they're talking about there. Uh, which is used to clean threads on a bolt to be reused? That's typically, we would basically use a die for that or a thread chaser, whichever. Um, I've actually got a big uh, thread chaser that was made for cleaning the spindle threads on these different vehicles. How many of you know that when you're pulling the, like on this Ranger, you know when you pull a little dust cap off and you pull the cutter key out and there's a nut there that, that cutter key through, you know? How many of you know that you do not use an impact wrench on that bolt? You do not use an impact wrench on that. I have had some people, when I had my back turned and was doing that job, they figure out, this is a big bolt. I'm going to have to use an impact wrench. I guess they'd been pulling a CV axle or something. And they just destroyed that nut, tightened it up with the impact wrench, too. Anyway, you do that on that bearing. You know, you're setting a little pretty little that bearing, I think. Anyway, and then we had to follow up and tap those. I got a, that. It's a big thing. It sort of opens up. It's got various different holes in it, you know, that are that's got threads in them. And it's made to tap those. And I, fortunately, I had one, and it would fit. And I fixed those threads. I got another nut. And uh, But... How many of you other, I've talked about this other time too, they put a lug nut on backwards. <laughs> Seen that before. I had, you know, one of the cars that we uh, had out here, one of our trainer cars, and I pulled a hubcap off one day and I noticed the, hub, the lug nuts were on backwards. And the only thing that bothered me about that was I didn't know who did that. So I could tell them not to. You got me? You ever seen lug nuts on backwards? You will. It may happen at the next place you work. Can't ever tell. All right. Okay. All right, what number are we on? 46. C is the answer to that one. 46. Some sheet metal screws are also known as self-tapping. What type of washer is used to provide an even clamping force? Flat. Flat washer. All of these are types of snap rings except for... They're all snap rings. Got me? Mm -hmm. All right, now 49. Technician A says door panels use Christmas tree clips. Technician B says special tools are used to remove door panel clips to prevent damage and SC. What type of fastener is used with a cotter pin? Nine. Huh? Nine. Nine. Those are all pins. Uh, How about a clevis pin? A clevis pin. Really? Now what, let me tell you about a clevis pin. What a clevis pin is, and you've seen this before. A clevis pin is basically, it's got a hole here, I got a hole here. And I'm going to run a pin through both of those. And this side, this has got a head on it, and that side is drilled. See? So you're running this through two holes, and you're going to put a cut key. Think about the, uh, it's sort of like the axle that's got a wheel on it. You know, you stick a little cutter key in there. A clevis pin has basically got a, if you got a, you see these little things on the end of a rod? And, it looks like this. And it's threaded. And it's got a pin that goes through here. And you're going to put a cotter key right there. Got it? This is a clevis. That's what this is. You've seen them kind of things before. before. Yeah, or it's be like, yeah, anything like on tractors, they use them a lot. They use them on choppers, helicopters. You don't see a whole lot of these on cars. But that's a clevis. You know what I'm all right. Anybody got any questions or comments? Has everybody yeah. turned into a skeleton? Do you do the answer to number four? Uh, no.